The David Marsden Lecture was created to recognize an outstanding scholar and inspiring neuroscientist in the field of movement disorders. This, year, this year's awardee is Professor Ole Lindvat from the University of Lund, who perfectly fits this profile. Professor Limbal received his PhD in 1974 and MD in 1978 from the University of Lund in Sweden and has been affiliated with the school for more than 45 years. He served as chairman of the Division of Neurology until 2012, the Department of Clinical Neuroscience from 2001 to 2003, and was vice dean of the medical faculty, University of Lund, 1997 to 99. And in 2014, he was appointed senior professor of neurology at the University of Lund. It would be impossible because of the innumerable achievements and contributions that Professor Lindvall has generated to enumerate all of them, but I would like to mention that he has led the clinical cell transplantation program for Parkinson's patients at Lund University Hospital between 1983 and 2012. And this program pioneered the use of neuronal replacement as a possible novel therapeutic strategy to restore function in the diseased human brain. And in that regard, Professor Limval will be talking about developing cell therapy for neurodegenerative disease a lifelong journey. Professor Lindvall. First, I would like to thank the Movement Disorder Society for selecting me to give this lecture. David Morstan was a great inspiration to me uh, during an, an important part of my career. And every time I met him, as on this photograph from uh, 1987, I felt that I got new energy in my work. Uh, David was definitely the most brilliant scientist clinician I have ever met. Trying to repair the brain and restore function in Parkinson's disease and other diseases by replacing dead cells with new healthy cells has really been a lifelong journey for me. And since you heard already yesterday about the current status of cell transplantation in Parkinson's disease, I thought that I would instead give you some personal recollections from this scientific journey and end up by describing to you why I think we are in an extremely exciting time when it comes to cell therapy for brain diseases. When I started as a young physician in clinical neurology in 1976, after having finished my uh, uh, PhD thesis in 1974, uh, the situation was very different. And the dogma of brain repair and, and uh, plasticity is very well illustrated by Cajal's wor uh, words. In the adult brain, the nerve paths are fixed and immutable. Everything can die, nothing can be regenerated. And when I was talking about some very exciting data that has come out from basic science in the mid or late 70s with my first boss, uh, uh, Ragnar Müller, who was an excellent clinician and lecturer, he just met me with strong disbelief. He said to me, that the clinical application of brain repair has never been possible in the past and will never be possible in the future. Uh, but in 1979, there were uh, two articles published which actually had clear clinical implications. And those two were published independently by the Stockholm Group together with people in the United, collaborators in the United States and by the Lund Group with Anders Björklund and Uns Denewe, uh, showing that you could transplant fetal mesencephalic dopamine-rich tissue to the brain of rodents and ameliorate the symptoms of Parkinsonism in an animal model. And this, of course, triggered directly the possibility or raised the possibility that it would be possible to develop a transplantation therapy for patients with Parkinson's disease. I was um, 
very excited about these data, uh, about the preclinical data, but I was uh, very hesitant about the clinical translation for two main reasons. First, the first reason was the pr practical one. Would it be possible to collect human fetal mesencephalic dopamine-rich tissue from routine abortions? Would it be possible to identify the ventral mesencephalon containing the dopaminergic neurons? And finally, would it be possible to put cells into the human brain without any adverse effects? The second uh, uh, hesitation, the second uh, concern was, of course, and most important was the ethical one. Would it be morally and ethically justified to use tissue from aborted human fetuses, collect and then transplant them to patients with severe motor problems, to Parkinson patients with severe motor problems. And this was not easy. I had, after a long, and took time, and after a long consideration, I came to the conclusion that it is, in my view, justified ethically and morally to uh, uh, use human fetal tissue as well as human embryonic stem cells for this purpose. But the first uh, transplantation in, uh, in the clinic uh, were not performed with human fetal mesencephalic tissue, but with adrenal medulla tissue. And th those studies uh, were um, based on an article in Nature providing some evidence that grafts of adrenal medulla tissue containing, of course, catecholamines, that they could ameliorate uh, a rotational asymmetry in a model of Parkinson's disease. And this has led uh, um, uh, Erik Olof Backlund, uh, Oke Sager, and Lars Olsson to perform two implantations, uh, or implantation in two patients in 1982 and 83 uh, with implants in the chordate nucleus. Uh, and when I met with Lars Olson at the meeting, we decided that we should start a collaboration and introduce two major improvements. The first one was to implant in the putamen instead of the chordate nucleus uh, in order to have a better chance of improving motor function. And the other was to actually improve the neuro neurological assessment of motor function to be able to detect also changes in uh, p parts of the body. And so actually the, f the data from the first patients were inconclusive. Uh, so we developed a test battery to detect changes therapeutically valuable or not in motor function in patients. And, um, Patients were uh, um, then, two patients were operated on 19 and 20 of April 1985. And I remember this very, very well because in the surgery room, the surgery room was crowded. There were more than 20 people who wanted to be present at this unique occasion. It was the third brain transplant in the world. And I remember we also had a syringe of haloperidol available in the surgery room in case the patient would react with an acute psychosis due to catecholamine release. But nothing happened, however. Uh, and the patients were followed very uh, um, uh, closely. Uh, and uh, we uh, uh, made a, uh, also, um, um, uh, over the first six months, and I was going to report about these data uh, at a, a meeting uh, at the New York Academy of Sciences. The data showed that there was a very slight uh, transient improvement in motor function, primarily on the side contralateral to the growth. And I remember when I was uh, um, 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 describing the data. I gave my talk at this day, April 4th, 1986, at the New York Academy of Sciences, and I was um, met with uh, the audience was overtly negative to my talk. And uh, 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 people uh, literally threw rotten tomatoes at me. Uh, uh, and interestingly, the discussion was published, uh, so even if the text is slightly polished, 
uh, we can read statement like this by uh, an excellent neuroanatomist, Constantino Sotelo. Having been a neurobiologist for 25 years, I would rather do experiments in animals than in humans. Uh, by, a, uh, oops, by a colleague, uh, Mark Perlo, you described the beneficial result to catecholamine release. I don't find any evidence in your paper that there was any catecholamine release, and I wonder how you could come to that conclusion. And then from Stan, who I admired tremendously already at that time, uh, it always amazes me how careful basic laboratory scientists are to have controls in animal experiments. But once they start working on patients, the control disappears out of the window and we are left with bad treatment for years. I was uh, disappointed and I was very worried. Uh, because in my view, the study had given some important information. First, that it was possible to put cells into the human putamen without adverse effects. And second, that we could detect some minor changes using our test battery. But would it be possible to um, continue with clinical transplantation despite the fact that the recommendations of the meeting was to continue with animal experiments for the next 10, 15 years. Um, uh, that night I shared hotel room with uh, um, Anders Björklund, my colleague. We had done a lot of studies during the 70s and uh, uh, 80s. Uh, uh, this is an early uh, photograph from Paris when he had a lecture tour in 1974. And we shared hotel room and during the night we discussed this uh, argument for continuing with human fetal tissue or with cell transplantation or and we decided, uh, I remember it very well, that we should continue with the cell transplantation program with human fetal tissue uh, despite the resistance of the scientific and clinical community. Uh, and um, the, uh, the, uh, what we, what, uh, what we did then as one step, and a very important step, was uh, a meeting with Richard Frakowiak and David Morstan in London. Uh, uh, and the question at that meeting, uh, which was held in June 1986, was would the uh, available methods have the resolution and sensitivity so it would be possible to detect surviving dopaminergic graft after transplantation in a patient's brain? And um, this had never been, no one knew if that would be possible, but after two hours of discussion, we came to the conclusion that it might be possible using fluorodopa and PET scanning to detect a surviving dopaminergic growth. <clears throat> so in September 1987, I went to, uh, uh, together with my nurse uh, to um, uh, London with two patients for PET scanning and uh, 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 preoperative PET scanning. And the, uh, the patients needed a helmet uh, in order to, uh, so that there would be no movements during the PET scanning. And then also the patient had to lie down several hours uh, during the PET scanning without having taken anti Parkinsonian medication. And uh, this was, of course, extremely tough for the patients, and they were really heroes. This shows the photograph when we have completed, or Nico Lenders, uh, who had completed the first PET scanning, and everyone was very happy. Uh, uh, we, uh, uh, Richard Frakovia, who, who you can see to the left, he was uh, uh, opening a bottle of champagne, and we all cheered and were very happy about this successful uh, um, uh, scanning. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we lost uh, most of the data during the night uh, due to a computer failure, so Richard became furious. Um, oops. Uh, an important step in the clinical translation was this work which uh, we had together with Patrick Brandin and which was included in his thesis where we could show that we could get survival of dopaminergic neurons from human fetuses in rat brain. They could reinnovate the stratum, they could also ameliorate behavioral deficits after intrastratal transplantation in dopamine-denervated rats. 
So um, we went ahead with the first transplantations on uh, November 10 and December 8, 1987 in two patients. Uh, we identified the ventral mesencephalon, uh, uh, they made a cell suspension and which was implanted into the stratum of two patients unilaterally. Uh, and here you can see D-Day, the first transplantations we made, did with human fetal tissue. On the left, you can see Patrick Brandin uh, with uh, clothes, clothes uh, uh, suitable for dissecting the tissue. Anders Björklund is checking the viability of the, of the cells. And then uh, uh, from the surgery room, Stig Renkrona uh, is putting in uh, um, the uh, tissue and uh, uh, also Hoka Wiener who was uh, responsible for the immunosuppression is present. Um, of course this was a major uh, th uh, event for us and we were very very excited about what was going to happen and the, what we had decided was that we should not reveal anything during the first six months uh, patients were monitored very carefully we had a PET scanning at six months to see if growths had survived or not, and then I was going to uh, present the data on, the, uh, on an international symposium uh, on Parkinson's disease uh, in Jerusalem in June 1988. And uh, uh, the um, meeting approach, the media interest was very, very high, and, uh, um, but unfortunately um, uh, what we saw was only minor uh, improvement and there was no detectable change in fluorodopa PET even if we later found that there was a small dopaminergic growth on autopsy 21 years later in the first patient. So I was standing there, the media interest was very high, the, uh, there was a film crew from the BBC so my presentation showing now once again in principle lack of improvement uh, and um, uh, the, uh, so that presentation was filmed uh, and um, I was of course very disappointed once again but uh, this was not the time to give up and I remember a quotation from Winston Churchill saying that uh, success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. I think that was perfect at this moment. Uh, but we had to uh, improve the transplantation procedure and Patrick Brandin found in his preclinical studies that the size of the implantation instrument was important uh, and we also realized that we have had to have more implantation sites in the putamen in order to cover the entire structure so therefore we went ahead with uh, transplantation in two more patients um, in uh, um, uh, April and May 1989 and I remember that summer because I was, I was uh, uh, evaluating the patients once a week clinically and then once a month with an L-DOPA test and after three months in patient number three one could clearly uh, notice that there was an improvement in his clinical condition his mobility in the, on the side of the body, contralateral to the growth, was faster, uh, 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 rigidity was less. Uh, the, his condition in the morning before the first L-DOPA dose was uh, um, uh, improved. And also the L-DOPA dose, if in the test, uh, uh, had a, a longer effect. So after five months, we decided that we should see whether this improvement was due to a surviving dopaminergic growth. Uh, and we decided to perform a PET scan. And this time, Anders and I, together with the patient, we went to London. And uh, I remember this, that already at the time of the uh, scanning, when we were sitting there looking at the computer, there was evidence that the... Um, that there was a surviving growth. And I remember how excited I was. Would it really be possible? I didn't believe that it was true. And when I came home to my wife, and she asked me how, uh, how was it, how did it go? And I said that, well, I didn't know why, maybe I, I, I didn't. But after a few days, it was confirmed that there was actually a surviving growth in the putamen. And um, this finding that it is possible to put 
neurons into the adult human brain, a brain with a chronic neurodegenerative disorder, and get survival of these cells, and that they can actually influence the function of the host brain, that that was the most exciting finding during my entire scientific career. And of course, this also, um, uh, when our paper was published in Science in 1990, uh, it created an enormous media interest, and um, uh, it was on CNN. There were many, both national and uh, international papers published uh, reporting of this finding. Uh, this is our uh, more local paper, Lund scientists succeeded. Uh, um, uh, this is uh, more like some kind of Hamlet version of the story. Uh, um, and then also there were uh, uh, reports in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Washington Post. Since then, there has been four major milestones of the journey, uh, on my scientific journey. Uh, and the first one is that growth can survive, that they can uh, release dopamine, and that they could, in some patients, have, be associated with major clinical improvement despite an ongoing disease process. Um, also, especially uh, after the uh, negative sham surgery control uh, uh, trials uh, to demonstrate that dopaminergic denervation pattern outside grafted areas determine the functional outcome after transplantation. The finding that uh, Lewy bodies uh, uh, can be present in a fraction, small fraction of grafted cells more than a decade after transplantation, which has triggered a, uh, um, a completely new research field in Parkinson's disease. And finally, uh, that serotonergic neurons in the graft are important for the adverse effects that we and several others reported after transplantation, the growth used is kinesias. And I just want to mention one of these milestones because it was on one of the occasions where Peter, Peter Hagel, who was then my PhD student, he is now a professor, and I, we went with two patients for PET scanning in London, and then Paola Piccini uh, told, told us that there was a she had a colleague who had uh, been uh, able to uh, monitor and uh, quantify dopamine release in vivo in a normal subject uh, who had been playing a, um, a video game and do that with um, PET scanning. Uh, and the method is that you use raclopride as a tracer, it binds to dopamine D2 receptors, but is, it is displaced by endogenous dopamine. So high binding uh, uh, indicates low dopamine release and low binding high dopamine release. Um, and uh, of course, ex I, immediately this triggered an idea that we should, would it be possible to quantify dopamine release from grafted dopaminergic neurons. So um, uh, uh, we planned for this study. We had a quite perfect patient, a unique patient for this purpose, who had been grafted only on one side of the brain, and the other side could then be used as a control. Uh, I must admit that I was not very optimistic. I was excited, but I was not very optimistic. I didn't think it would work. But the patient was very enthusiastic. He had done very, very well after transplantation and been able to stop l dopa medication. So uh, uh, this patient and I, we went to London. We had dinner in a nice restaurant after uh, 10 years after his uh, transplantation. Uh, before transplantation, he could hardly move. Uh, um, without uh, L-DOPA. Now we hadn't taken L-DOPA for, for many years. Uh, and um, so we did the PET scanning. One scan with uh, uh, saline, one scan with amphetamine to uh, look at the, dope, the uh, drug-induced dopamine release from the grafts. And uh, then we went home. And I didn't hear anything from Paula, and I was absolutely convinced that it had failed. So after a couple of weeks, I called Paula and asked what happened, and she told me everything went exactly as predicted. It was the ideal scenario, which means that the patient in the fluorodopa scan, he had a, full, uh, a normal fluorodopa uptake, 
whereas with and with the raclopride, both with uh, uh, placebo and uh, the um, uh, um, uh, he had a uh, uh, on the grafted side similar to normal subject on the non grafted side there was a, a high binding which indicates that there was very little dopamine and then you could by uh, uh, using uh, amphetamine you could uh, uh, release dopamine and quantify that nothing happened on the non grafted side so this in this patient with a major clinical improvement uh, the graft had also restored fluorodopa uptake as a measure of dopaminergic uh, 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 innovation and dopamine relates to normal levels. And uh, our paper was uh, directly published in Nature Neuroscience and we even got this cover uh, on, on uh, the issue. <coughs> Yesterday, uh, where I was unfortunately not able to participate, you heard about the current status of grafting and also with fetal cells and that there, were two, there are two sham surgery control style studies which have not shown any uh, uh, significant clinical benefit. And I will not discuss that here, but I would just want to mention to you what I think are the most the best evidence from the open label trials that this uh, uh, strategy may work. And these are two patients uh, who have been followed, uh, and they were selected in London and have been followed in London. And uh, uh, this patient, he was diagnosed in 1983. He was grafted bilaterally in the stratum in 1993 and 1994. And uh, four years after transplantation, he could withdraw his L-DOPA medication, dopaminergic medication completely. This patient was diagnosed in 1985. He was uh, grafted bilaterally in 1996, and also on during the fifth post uh, year, he could re remove all, all his dopaminergic medication. And you can, there are two points I want to make. One point is that uh, at uh, uh, um, uh, 16 and 13 years after transplantation, 26 and 24 years after diagnosis, and about 10 years after withdrawal of L-DOPA medication, they have a UPDRS motor score around 10. And gradually, their uh, condition or their uh, fluorodopa uptake has become normal, and they also have a normal uh, dopamine release in the stratum, in the putamen. Um, so, um, what I think one can conclude from the cell transplantation field in Parkinson's disease is that there has been a steady scientific progress in this field since 1985. But, and the, there is proof of principle that neuronal replacement can work in the diseased human brain. Growths can re-innovate denovated areas, they can become functionally integrated, they can release transmitter and they can restore function in the deceased 50, 60 years old patient's brain. But uh, as I'm sure you heard yesterday also, current self-transplantation procedures do not provide clinically competitive treatment. So why do I think that we are living in an extremely exciting time now for cell therapy research? Well, uh, <clears throat> now we know that neurons for transplantation can be generated from different sources of stem cells and reprogrammed cells. You heard that yesterday not just dopaminergic neurons, but also other subtype specific neurons. And also that we have neural stem cells in our brain, both in the uh, uh, normal and in the uh, diseased brain. And finally, that there is now also evidence that you can generate di neurons directly from glial cells and other cells in vivo in the brain by in vivo reprogramming. Um, <clears throat> yesterday you heard that dopaminergic neurons and also other types of neurons which may uh, be important for Parkinson's and other diseases. Uh, you can uh, uh, get dopaminergic neurons from neural stem cells, uh, you can get them from uh, pluripotent cells, uh, from other from, uh, generated from blastocyst, human embryonic stem cells or fibroblasts. And you can also get dopamine neurons directly from fibroblasts uh, uh, and they can be used for transplantation. The, um, but we also have 
uh, uh, neural stem cells in our adult brains, uh, and new neurons are continuously uh, generated in these areas. These are the neural stem cells around the ventricle, uh, around the ventricle in the lateral ventricle, uh, and then we have also in the dentate gyrus, uh, giving rise to uh, granule cells and important for learning and memory. And we showed uh, uh, several years ago uh, in rodents that uh, the, uh, these uh, neural stem cells, they can respond to an injury, to a disease, by, uh, 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 for example, in stroke, where there is a, a big lesion in the uh, striatum and the overlying cortex, they start to proliferate, they form new neurons, neur neuroblasts, which migrate towards the injury and then uh, 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 differentiate to mature neurons. And this potential self-repair mechanism was recently, uh, um, uh, the interest was recently stimulated a lot by the finding from Jonas Friesen's group using carbon-14 dating that um, actually in the adult human brain, there is in the, uh, uh, the subventricular zone, there is a proliferation of cells, of neural stem cells, and they give rise to neuroblasts which enter the striatum uh, where they differentiate to striatal neurons. And interestingly, this mechanism is suppressed in patients with Huntington's disease. And finally, and this is of course very far from the clinic, that we know now that glial cells can be directly reprogrammed to functional neurons in vivo in the adult animal, adult uh, rodent brain. And what uh, uh, scientists have done is to uh, use a viral vector uh, expressing a transcription factor that has been injected into the brain uh, and been able to convert astrocytes to functional neurons. And this has also in vitro been shown to be able to uh, convert a human glial cells, an astrocyte, to a functional neurons. What will come out of this, we don't know. But we now have many, many tools to continue to develop this field, which makes me extremely excited. Um, uh, and uh, what I wanted to say at the end is that uh, <coughs> I hope I have illustrated for you that there is no false track for cell therapy in these type of disorders. But with the rapidly uh, increasing knowledge about brain plasticity and cell pl uh, plasticity, I'm convinced that we will be able to develop clinically competitive cell therapies in the future. But finally, if you ask me, how far have we reached? How, where are you now on this development? How far have you reached? I would like to answer by using another quotation from Winston Churchill. I think uh, we can say that this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Um, the journey I've been uh, telling you about has not been possible without a lot of uh, uh, excellent scientists, and I want to thank all of them for having contributed to this journey. Uh, s many of them are my very uh, uh, close personal friends also since many years. So thank you all very much. I just want to mention that um, Dr. Jankovic showed a picture of the founders of the society and all but one of them are in the audience today and it must be very gratifying to see how far this field and our society has come these last 30 years. Congratulations to our junior awardees and to Dr. Jankovic and Linval for fantastic contributions this morning and that will conclude this morning's session.